there's a very basic political divide. In fact, I heard it on C-SPAN last week. People ask, are humans basically good or basically bad? Um, liberals often say, we're basically good. We're natural socialists <clears throat> who enjoy sharing and just corrupted by a culture of private property and capitalism. Uh, conservatives often say, we're basically bad. We're self-interested, selfish, exploitive, and we need culture to rein in those motives. So which is true? Is human nature basically good or basically bad? I would say neither. Um, that for an evolutionary psychologist like me, it's, it's not a scientifically coherent uh, question. And here's why. From my strange point of view, <clears throat> the human brain is a computational system that's produced by evolution. It's composed of many different programs that are evolved adaptations. Each of these evolved programs is designed to execute its functions when it detects cues that the problem that it evolved to solve is at hand. <clears throat> and these programs do lots of different things from causing family love and aggression to cooperation and theft. They, they do different things. So human nature, to me, is a collection of reliably developing species-typical information processing adaptations. From this point of view, we're not basically good or bad. Basically, we're collections of adaptations that execute their functions, or adaptation executors. From this view, the mind, the mind is not a blank slate or a, a, a content-free copying machine. It contains a lot of functionally specialized programs, each well-engineered for solving a different adaptive problem, mating, hunting, cooperating in groups, problems, faced, problems in survival and, and reproduction faced by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Those problems evolved to navigate a small-scale social world. The hunter-gatherers from whom we're descended lived in small, face-to-face -face, um, bands, semi-nomadic ones, of anywhere from 50 to 200 people, men, women, and children included, uh, all, many of whom were family, friends, neighbors, people they knew. Um, people they knew, whose character they knew, and who, where they knew what they were doing. They could monitor their behavior. Now, our mind is very well designed for understanding that vanished world, obviously not markets in which we cooperate, mostly indirectly, with millions of anonymous strangers. So when we're seeing markets, when we're seeing the modern world, <coughs> we're seeing it through the eyes of our ancestors, through a, a, a brain that was designed uh, by a world that doesn't exist anymore. Now, importantly, a lot of these evolved programs are content-rich and, and domain-specific in, in a way that used to be called by philosophers as which you could think of as innate ideas in them. Like expert systems in artificial intelligence, they're equipped with concepts and inferences that apply in one domain, uh, but not in others. These organize our experiences, and, and actually, they don't constrain what we do. Without them, we would learn nothing. They generate particular inferences, inject recurrent concepts and motivations into our mental life. They give us our passions and motivations, cause us to think certain very specific thoughts, make certain ideas, feelings, and reactions seem reasonable, interesting, and memorable. Consequently, they pay a, play a key role in shaping human culture and society. Um, knowing the structure of them is necessary for understanding why some ideas spread very easily from mind to mind and others don't, and why some institutions succeed and others fail. So the key point I want to make today <clears throat> for understanding socialism and human nature is that several different evolved programs regulate cooperation and sharing. And so just to start out, I want to ask, well, was Karl right, Marx right about collective action in hunter-gatherers? If you remember, what, what Karl Marx thought was he believed that existing hunter-gatherers, data was coming from anthropologists going to different parts of the world, colonial parts of the world, and coming back to Europe, um, and by extension, our ancestors, he believed that they lived in a, a state of primitive communism where all labor was accomplished through collective action, and sharing was governed by the decision rule from each according to his ability to each according to his need. He thought that the overthrow of capitalism would bring forth an economically advanced society with similar properties. All you need to do is abolish private property, and all labor will once again be accomplished through collective action. And because the mind reflects the material conditions of existence, I'm not exactly sure what's meant by that, but the hunter-gatherer communal sharing role is going to emerge once again and dominate social life. And as you know, based on his theory, 20th century institutions and laws governing property, labor, trade, the legitimacy of consent and dissent were changed all across the planet with a big impact on the lives 
of the people in those countries, but not at all the utopian ones that he had hoped for. <clears throat> so was he right? It was his view of hunter-gatherer labor and sharing rules correct? And if not, what cognitive programs generating cooperation did the selection pressures endemic to hunter-gatherer life build? Well, there's been many, many studies of, of existing hunter-gatherers and converging evidence from paleoanthropology. And my, one of my favorites is this classic study by, um, by Hilly Kaplan, Hillard Kaplan and Kim Hill on food sharing among at Ache for, foragers in Paraguay. And what they find, and this is what basically everybody who studies hunter-gatherers finds, is that hunter-gatherers are, yes, they're cooperative, but it's not an orgy of indiscriminate cooperation. Um, there are several al alternative sharing rules, even within the same cultural group, for different kinds of goods and resources. And one of the important triggers for alternative sharing rules is perception of variance due to luck uh, versus effort. So what do I mean by triggered? Well, some cultural patterns are evoked, not, not merely transmitted. Complex patterns can be elicited by cues that activate a specific evolved mechanism, where the behavioral complexity arises from the evolved mechanism, uh, not transmitted cultural knowledge. And so in, in this way, <clears throat> I apologize for my voice, I'm getting over a cold. Um, our brains are like something that you see on the streets of Santa Barbara that's called the Santa Barbara land shark, especially when it comes to cooperation. With, where we have many different kinds of, of programs generated by different evolved systems cooperation. So this is the Santa Barbara land shark. If you're sitting in a cafe on State Street in Santa Barbara, you might see this go down this, the, the street and you might say, oh, look, it's a tour bus, nice tour bus. Then you might see this. What? What, 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 what is this thing? Then you might see this. What is it? Is it a boat? Is it a bus? What? It's two mints in one. What, what is this? Um, it's the same vehicle, and its general function is transport, um, in the same way that a general function might be cooperation. But it contains complex machinery that generates two alternative modes of operation. And which set of machinery is activated is triggered by information about the local environment, here provided by the perceptual system of the driver. Um, when it's on the street, it operates as a bus. The wheels come down, it rolls. When it's on the ocean, it operates on the boat. Uh, uh, there's a propeller and rudder engage. It moves by displacing water. So the experience of the street versus the ocean doesn't create these two different complex functional designs, the wheels versus the propellers, et cetera. It activates them. So what I would say is that our, <coughs> our, we have a land shark brain. Uh, there are many different evolved systems regulating cooperation. Um, there's risk pool reciprocation, where the lucky share with unlucky and reverse roles, and that's what I'm going to talk most about. There is social exchange, favors, different, uh, trading different resources, et cetera. Collective action, cooperation with two, three, or more people to achieve a common goal and share the resulting benefits. And that can happen in rather pro-social contexts like hunting or shelter building, but also in warfare, in coalitional aggression. And then other deep engagement relationships that John may mention, I'm not sure about, of friendship that involved valued in individuality with close, close others. So the first case I want to talk about is <coughs> all, this case, this situation from Kaplan and Hill about alternative sharing rules within the same hunter-gatherer group. So hunting is a risky business. Um, you, on four out of 10 hunts, you'll come back with nothing, even when you're trying really hard. It, the variance in success is very high, and it's mostly due to luck, not skill as a hunter. With, with, with meat, with hunted foods, what, what hunter-gatherers mostly do is they pool the risk. They pool this risk. There's up to band level sharing to deal with these frequent reversal of fortunes. I come back with nothing today, you share with me. You come back with nothing tomorrow, I share with you. I'm storing food in the form of a social obligation with other people. And this is closest to the sharing rule from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It may be what the anthropologists were noting when the anthropologists from whom he was getting his information were noting. I don't know. Other foods, like gathered foods, um, when, when you're gathering uh, nuts, when you're gathering plant foods, there the variance in foraging success this is, is low. And the variance is mostly due to effort. Did you go out? Did you try? Did you forage today? Those foods are shared primarily within the family and via reciprocation with particular partners. 
And then other goods are shared by, by reciprocation or trade, even with people in other, other bands. Well, what gives rise to this pattern? Is it a culturally accumulated package of norms plus with, that are acquired by some sort of content-free learning plus imitation? Or, or are our minds like the Santa Barbara land shark with alternative sharing rules triggered by the experience of high versus low variance? Well, you can't just tell by merely noticing, noticing differences between cultures. You need to know more about the design of the mind. Well, so you can ask, well, <clears throat> to elicit these patterns, do you have to have knowledge that you acquired by hunting and gathering? Did you have to be a hunter-gatherer to have this, this, um, uh, th these different sharing rules? So you can ask, what about people raised in weird cultures, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic cultures? Well, if you do this with Japanese and American college students, give them a verbal lottery, so, and it's one shot, um, they're more willing to share uh, share uh, the high variance resource and the low variance resource. Um, and, that, and that holds regardless of, of the subject's particular ideologies about distributive justice. You can also then ask, well, how quickly do weird people detect resource variance and respond with sharing? So this was addressed, uh, Vernon Smith and Bart Wilson teamed up with um, Hillard Kaplan of the study that I was showing you before and another anthropologist, Eric Schneider. Um, and they asked a very entertaining question, which is what happens when Southern Californians forage? Um, do, do weird people behave like hunter-gatherers? So they, they created a virtual world for foraging, uh, a game where eight people forage and they discover properties of the world. And you have an avatar and the, each person has an avatar of a different color, but we're anonymous to each other. Um, and each round you choose whether to forage on the red patch or the blue patch. The red patch is, very, is a very high variance patch. Um, high variance, high mean patch. Uh, the blue patch is low variance, low mean patch. Now, when, after you forage, you can put resources in your own pot or another avatar's pot. And after a round of foraging, avatars can communicate with one another, um, but there's no mechanism for enforcing contracts. And uh, there's 20 rounds, but the subjects don't know how many there'll be. So does spontaneous reciprocal sharing emerge? Um, and if so, is there only one sharing norm? Is sharing the same in response to both patches? Is it triggered in response to the high variance patch only? How long, if, if that, how long before the high variance patch triggers more sharing? Is it immediate? Does it take a long time? And given an ancestral pattern of, of men hunting and specializing in high variance resources, meat, um, in response to the high variance patch, do men respond more strongly to it than women? Well, this, this is showing, this is showing the, the, the data. And what you're seeing, I can't exactly point, but um, spontaneous reciprocal sharing, these are the rounds. Um, this is sharing on the low variance patch, men and women. And those two are the high variance patch. The dark line is men, and the dotted line is women. Um, and what you're seeing is for the high variance research, you're getting, you're getting uh, spontaneous sharing emerging, and it's even happening on the first round here, immediately, immediately. Um, you, you're not getting it for the low variance resource. It stays low the whole time. And, and, uh, and you're also, interestingly, although both men and women are sharing more in response to the high variance patch, the, the, the men are choosing the high variance patch more, and, and once they've chosen it, they share more on that patch. Um, but both are sharing hugely on the high variance patch. In other words, these weird people are immediately detecting which patch is high, high variance, high, high gain versus low variance, low gain. And they responded to that experience of luck with risk pool sharing. It's just very natural to us. It's the fingerprints of evoked culture, of the land shark, of, of the behavioral complexity arising from a mechanism that's activated um, by alternative cues. Well, what happens when someone fails to cooperate? Do our minds categorize that person as a free rider or cheater to be punished, avoided, excluded, um, just by virtue of failing to cooperate or failing to give as much? Well, it turns out that actually categorizing everyone who contributes less than others as a free rider would be a, a bad design from an evolutionary perspective. Because there's an important adaptive problem, which is that in hunter-gatherer ecologies, and now, every cooperator is at some time going to fail to contribute due to mistake, injury, or error, and excluding or punishing those those people is going to be a large fitness error, error because you need repeated gains in trade to get selection for cooperation in the first place. 
So the solution is concepts and inference systems that look for and respond to cooperative versus exploitive motivations. And it turns out that that distinction is embedded within a lot of evolved programs, including in our research, reasoning mechanisms specialized for social exchange that look for cheaters, not innocent mistakes, in a free rider concept in collective action that attaches to people with exploitive attempt, intent, but not those who fail by accident. Then it happens without conscious awareness. It's almost as if we have a grammar of sharing. Where these two sound reasonable, if he's a victim of an unlucky tragedy, then we should pitch in to help him out. If he spends his time loafing and living off of others, then he doesn't deserve our help. Those sound kind of human. Here are two that sound very weird. If he's a victim of an unlucky tragedy, then he doesn't deserve our help. If he spends his time loafing and living off others, then we should pitch in and help him out. Those sound kind of weird to a human mind. And a lot of cultural attitudes and transmission might be shaped by these same sharing rules. So if you think about the political debate about homelessness, people argue about whether people are homeless due to bad luck bad fortune, or whether it, they're not trying, whether it's low effort. But they don't argue about what follows from that. It's as if they just assume if it's bad luck, sharing, helping out is appropriate. If it's not, maybe it's not as appropriate. That part doesn't get debated or talked about. So political attitudes in mass cultures are sometimes shaped by mechanisms that evolve for this small scale social world. And our colleague Michael Bang Peterson is, in Denmark has done a lot on this. And one of my one, uh, particularly interesting one is how quick, quickly political attitudes can change by sharing these alternative rules, uh, triggering these alternative rules. So you can change perceptions of luck versus effort, and you can change people's attitudes about something like, like welfare. Um, it turns out that people have different defa default assumptions, different stereotypes about welfare recipients. So in Denmark, People think of people who are on social welfare as unlucky. In the US, more people think of them as lazy. Um, and so this is, this is opposition to social welfare. And it's higher in the US than, than, than in Denmark, uh, not surprisingly. But what happens if you replace that stereotype with information? So there's a control condition where you say nothing. There's a, a reciprocator condition where you say, imagine a man who's currently on social welfare. He's always had a regular job, but has now been the victim of a work-related injury. He's very motivated to get back to work again. And then the third condition is, imagine a man who's currently on social welfare. He has never had a regular job, but he's fit and healthy. He's not motivated to get a job. Well, what happens to attitudes towards welfare recipients? And is it different in Denmark or the United States? It turns out, when you make it clear, there's no difference between Danes and Americans. Um, when you have the laziness cues, they're both we're all opposed, more, more opposed to social welfare. When you have the effort cues, we're all less opposed to social welfare. And there was zero difference between Denmark and the US. They changed Danes into Americans and Americans into Danes with that simple information. So now, in light of the psychology, consider what happens in an economic downturn if we have this psychology that where different sharing rules are triggered by luck versus effort. Firms go out of business. People lose their jobs due to bad luck. Um, despite hard work, despite having cooperative motivations. Bad luck is causing high variance in foraging success. Factors having in the economy that had nothing to do with what I as an employee of a company was doing. <clears throat> Seeing that should activate motivations for band level sharing, risk pooling, redistribution from the lucky to the unlucky. If they're victims of, an, of bad luck, then we should pitch in to help them out. I want to help members of my band under those circumstances. And if the lucky are unwilling, they must be bad people. That's what humans do. We, when there's bad luck, we help each other out. That's, that's that sharing rule. Bad people, we should force them to do the right thing. Support goes up for, for government, band level, redistribution, low interest rates, business bailouts, et cetera, all framed as, as help for um, un, 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 an unlucky situation, which distorts prices, market signals, uh, causing, I don't need to tell you, causing a lot of malinvestment. Um, we're in the Hayek Auditorium, so I won't explain that. Uh, which is going to make more firms go out of business, which is going to make more new businesses fail because they're responding to the wrong kinds of information. Um, it's going to make it harder for people to, to save, to invest in new businesses. Job creation will suffer. As more businesses fail and fewer new jobs are created, everyone knows people who lost their jobs who are trying hard to find jobs but cannot. So you've got 
pe your experience, people with high effort and bad luck, activating more sympathy for redistribution, creating a negative feedback loop, the economy continues spiraling down, and liberty and prosperity suffer. The problem is that there's a mismatch, or one, one of many problems, is that there's a mismatch between the modern world versus the ancestral world. Our minds are equipped with programs that evolve to navigate a small world of relatives, friends, neighbors, not for cities and nation states of thousands or millions of anonymous people. Certain policies, laws, and institutions satisfy the moral intuitions these programs generate. But because these programs are now operating way outside the envelope of environments for which they're designed, laws that satisfy the moral intuitions they generate may regularly fail to produce the outcomes that we're desiring and anticipating. Even worse, they can cause us to overlook policies that might have the consequences that, that we're looking for. These mental programs can so powerfully structure our inferences that certain policies may seem self-evidently correct and other self-serving or immoral. But modern conditions often produce outcomes, as you know and we've known since Adam Smith, that seem paradoxical to our evolved programs. Venal motives can be the engines that reliably produce very humane outcomes. And what can seem like good intentions can make a hell on earth. So to preserve liberty and prosperity for all, yes, you absolutely need to know how markets work and understand the consequences of economic policies. But you also need to understand human nature because you need to be able to explain why certain, it's not enough to know what kinds of policies will help. You need to be able to explain why certain policies are helpful and others are harmful in ways that engage our evolved moral intuitions instead of fighting against them. Thank you.